Um, I want to talk about the, uh, the structure of the next university. And when we think about what the next university is likely to be like, and I have to, there we go. Um, there's a wide recognition that the next university will be shaped by technology. Uh, we all understand that, that new advances in, um, in, in distance learning and so forth will inform the way that the next university will work. We also understand that uh, changes in the marketplace, that the brutal efficiency of global markets and uh, the uh, limited generosity of the public sector mean that public universities are going to have to be really efficient and only offer things that they can offer better than anyone else. But there's a third thing, and that is the idea um, that uh, future universities will be shaped not just by technology, not just by markets, uh, but by human nature. And this is a fact that uh, analysts in education widely overlook. And, and when we think about human nature, we think about things like language, and we think perhaps about tool use, uh, and maybe we think about cooperation as well, that these are aspects of our, of our evolved character. But uh, cooperation uh, between, uh, between organisms, as between these two chimps, um, and, and tool use, do not exist only in dyads, only in pairs, but they exist in communities, in networks. And changes in network science are allowing us to systematically study this. I'm going to be talking about this. The, tech, the talk immediately after me will be talking about it as well, Gallen's talk. Um, this is an a, 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 a illustration of gift giving and desired campmates among the Hadza, a population of hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. We don't have to go into too much detail here, but what's interesting is that in order to understand the structure of cooperation, you need to look not just at a pair of individuals, but the whole group, the whole community. Here's another illustration of network science. This is a group of 60 individuals who are linked in a complex and wonderful way. Uh, they, they are a kidney transplant uh, community. And um, because a successful kidney transplant uh, requires a very close match in the uh, kidney proteins of donor and recipient, if you suffer advanced renal failure, the likelihood that I can help you directly is very small. But if we could be put together in a community where I could help somebody else, and that person could help somebody else, and so forth, then the likelihood of successful kidney transplant is increased. And that's what this chain is. Um, for example, Michael Wilkins at the far left here needed a kidney, and his wife, uh, Tremaine, was willing to offer one but theirs didn't match. So she instead gave hers to Mary Jane Wilson, whose son, Kent Bowen, in turn gave his to Olivo Cienfuegos. It's a wonderful story. Um, and it illustrates to me the idea that human potential lies not in the individual, but in the community. Now, uh, traditional universities lack the network sophistication of the Hadza, and they certainly lack the compassion of this network of kidney donors. Um, the way traditional universities are structured instead is in terms of an organizational hierarchy. Um, a hierarchy that looks like this, where the university structure is at the top, with colleges beneath them, departments beneath those, and individual faculty working in research silos independently. This is what I'm calling the structure of last U, the university of yesterday. Um, that university of yesterday, for what it is, is, has changed little today, but it has changed. Increasingly, the most important characteristic of modern science, modern social science, and to a limited extent, extent the humanities as well, uh, in recent years, has been that, that work has been increasingly collaborative. In all these disciplines, we see that the number of authors on each scientific article has increased. So from the standpoint of research, we see that the university of today is becoming increasingly collaborative. So in this illustration, we've got the two anthropologists, Cavell and Douglas, who are now working together. And Douglas may be informed by biology. Now, we could structure this. We could start to structure this in terms of a network. And when we do, what we see is something like the following. 
And now I'm moving away from the hypothetical case of, of uh, Baker, Cavell, and Douglas to the real case of 34 faculty uh, at, at this university. And uh, the faculty are linked by college and department. A, a thin line for faculty in the same department, excuse me, college, a thick line for faculty in the same department. And what we find is that a number of faculty are isolated. They are islands. But as John Dunn once told us, no person is an island. No professor is an island. Um, and that, that ideally, we're going to find syntheses of expertise and the creation of new knowledge if we can bring people together. So while in this view, faculty are isolated from each other, working largely individually, in next view, they will not be. Uh, this is the same 34 faculty linked not by college and department, but now by several parameters of shared interest. If we can bring together faculty in terms of their shared interest, we can create new syntheses, new forms of knowledge. Now, the structure of a university includes not just expertise, but I'm also going to talk about the structure of advising and the structure of student life and the structure of the classroom. And when we think about the structure of advising, we see that once again, last view was structured in terms of these colleges and, and departments or disciplines. Um, and this view looks pretty much the same. When you're advised whether or not to take a class, now you're still thinking, many of you, most of you, in terms of traditional departments, uh, but you might also be, in, that might be informed by some data. You might, for example, be thinking, gee whiz, rate my professors says stay away from Baker, so I'll take courses with Cavell and Douglas instead. And my governor, Rick Scott, says I should become a biology major because anthropologists are evil, are not evil, um, of limited use. Okay, so that's the structure of advising today. But again, it's not optimal. And it's not optimal in two ways. Uh, one is that it's based on crummy data. And there's a lot of data that's out there. All the data about who you are, what your interests are, what your aptitudes are, what your abilities are, what you love, what you hate, when you can get up in the morning, the kind of role model you're seeking, all of that could go into the system. Data about the structure of society, about real social problems, about real occupational needs. Data also about the structure of the university. What courses do we have and can we offer? Advising in the university of the future is going to look like that. And um, let me move forward to this. It's going to be informed by like a networks-like system of recommendations, where you can we it's informed by strong data. Okay. Now, that strong data is going to point us, in some cases, towards traditional disciplines, but not in many, because we're not students of disciplines. We're not students of departments. We're not students of majors. We are students of problems. We're students who care about the fact that our grandma can't navigate the healthcare system. And so we want to take courses that will inform that, that will address that. We want to take courses that will address um, the environment, okay? An issue like energy and the environment. What extent do you take courses in physics and environmental science and so forth? And in this space of 34 courses, again, that I've got illustrated here, you can describe some fuzzy areas. Areas circled here that correspond roughly to business, to um, hard sciences, and to humanities. But it's much more interesting to look at these same courses in terms of a network. And here, this is a network that I've constructed based on a hypothetical individual who wants to understand that very problem of fixing the healthcare system uh, for um, older Spanish-speaking uh, seniors. Okay? And the, one of the striking features about this network is not simply the, net, the courses that are in it, but the fact that it's actually a directed network. And that it makes sense, and one of my students pointed this out, that it makes sense to look at this network in an ordered way, that one should take some courses before others, for example, the academic writing course is more central. It's a good place to start. Okay? Again, a hypothetical example. What about student life? What can network science tell us about student life? 
Well, traditionally, student life had several characteristics. It was characterized by being male and drinking beer, um, and, and there was no dress code. The, um, this is a, a snapshot from Animal House. Uh, student life was characterized traditionally by structured extracurricular activities. And today, student life, the student social network, is characterized by something broad. We've got Facebook. I uh, spoke to a, my class on, in which we're studying social networks, 23 students, 23 were on Facebook. But the fact that 23 students were on Facebook does not mean that they were connected to each other. And this Facebook network, like most Facebook networks, we can find some isolates, some islands. Okay? But again, as John Dunn said, no person is an island. The biggest cause of dropping out of school is not because a student can't hack it. It's because a student is lonely, is disconnected, and is separate from the main. And the task, from a network science perspective, for universities concerned with student life, universities interested in reducing attrition, is to connect the dots, to bring everyone together into a common network. Okay, so much for student life. Everybody know what this is? It's a CAPTCHA. And I want to talk now about teaching and the role of faculty in the classroom. And what are CAPTCHAs for? CAPTCHAs allow, CAPTCHAs make it so that the uh, computer knows that a person is actually entering this. CAPTCHAs are things that humans can recognize better than computer algorithms. Okay? Um, which are kind of interesting. The question is, what can people do better than, better than algorithms? What can human professors do better than a program course of instruction? And I think that the cue comes from couches. And the cue also comes from something called Galaxy Zoo that some of you might be aware of. Galaxy Zoo is a map of the universe um, in which the astronomers who were working on it realized that they had no way of systematically coding galaxies, whether the galaxies were spiraling clockwise or counterclockwise, that no computer could determine this. But what could determine this is a human judge. And so they crowdsourced a Galaxy Zoo. You can go on the net and, and, and go there and, and help catalog the galaxy, catalog the universe, and tell us whether this galaxy is spiraling clockwise or counterclockwise, because you can do that better than any machine. But the things that our evolved character allow us to do better than any machine, better than any other task, is to assess the human face, to judge whether a human is characterized by understanding or confusion, by enjoyment or boredom, whether the person's on Facebook or napping or is, in fact, engaged in material. And in the University of Tomorrow, I think that things like MOOCs, massively organized online classes, and TED Talks, and things like it, are going to play an important role in educating people. But they cannot play the only role, because there's going to be a role for professors, for communities, to calibrate those talks in person with the audience. The role of the professor at NextView is going to be to calibrate, to translate from, just as we've done historically from books, from online presentations and lectures. So that's the big scheme. We see that NextView evolves from a research focus of silos in an organization to a multiply interconnected um, community. In advising, we see two changes from advising based on anecdote and majors to advise and focus on data, or based on data, and focused on problems. We see student life migrating towards a position of facilitated social networks. And by the way, the universities of today already have begun to do this with things like freshman learning communities. And finally, with respect to teaching, there must be some kind of an optimization of classroom and distance tech-based learning. 
Thank you very much.